From the Weston A. Price Foundation, welcome to the Wise Traditions Podcast for wise traditions in food, farming, and the healing arts. We are your source for scientific knowledge and traditional wisdom to help you achieve optimal health. And now here is our host and producer, Hilda Labrada Gore. Hey, Hilda here. Do you have a natural remedies toolkit to address digestive issues, bee stings, sleep troubles, and more? This is episode 437, and our guest today is Erin O'Donnell, the author of Fully Alive. Erin shares today what has worked for her family for all of the above. Tips include chamomile tea for calming the nervous system and avoiding pink eye, tart cherry juice for lowering inflammation, and getting naked in the garden. Erin talks about the issues her son had with a tongue tie and the changes she noticed once he had his phrenectomy. And finally, she also shares the surprising issue that negatively impacted her family's health for over one year that led to sleep issues, fungal overgrowth, and other things, and the simple solution that changed everything. Before we get into the conversation, I want to invite you to the Wise Traditions Conference this October in Kansas City, Missouri. The food is always Wise Traditions friendly, as you might expect, and delicious. The people are down to earth and beautiful, and the speakers are out of this world, including Tom Cowan, Alex Zek, Naomi Wolf, and of course, Sally Fallon Morrell. This is a conference that nourishes in every way. So join us. Go to wisetraditions.org to find out more and to register today. This is Hoda Labradagor, and you're listening to Wise Traditions. Welcome to Wise Traditions, Erin. Thanks, Hilda. You told me that your husband had to build you all a privacy fence. (laughs) And I think it might have something to do with your being naked in the garden. Tell us about this. What does that help and why? Yeah. So one of my like basic life goals is to be naked in a garden. We were created naked in a garden and then we sinned. We had to leave the garden. We were clothed like the Lord gave us clothes to cover our nakedness. So clothing is a result of sin and so is indoor housing because you are not in a garden if you're indoors. So whatever is wrong, whatever, cranky kids just like fighting because they're just fighting today. People are teething. People are tired because they have chronic sleep issues, which is totally my house. People fell off the couch and hit their head, which is what happened like a couple hours ago. We went outside. The crying stopped immediately. Whatever is wrong, it is so much less wrong when you go outside. And then like you have all these like good sensory things going on. You have the sun, hopefully fresh air, depending on where you live, maybe Mm -hmm. cold, maybe warm. You relax a little bit. And then just having that like relaxation tells your body like, oh, it's okay. We can go into heal mode. So it like, it does feel really good, but it literally heals you because your cortisol drops, your immune system can work again. So just go naked in a garden. So hopefully I'll get my privacy fence. (laughs) I love that idea. I think it can just totally change the mood and the dynamic, even if you didn't know the science behind how it lowers the cortisol and the earth gives you negative ions and all these things. Even if you knew nothing about that, it will change your family's mood and your own mood. It kind of gives you perspective. You see yourselves in creation. It's a whole different situation, isn't it? Yes. Yes. It feels good. Like whether we're young or old. Absolutely. Wow. I was just trying to figure out if you guys wear swimsuits or if you really go completely naked in the garden. (laughs) Oh, we don't actually go completely naked in the garden. I mean, I'll let like the little tiny people go totally naked in the garden. One of my favorite stories of Fiona, who's six now, I'm like big into belly sun. So like for little people, just like take off that shirt, go in the sun for big people, just like roll the shirt up, whatever, depending on where you are. But Fiona would get hot. So she would, mommy, can you take off my shirt so I can get some belly shade? Oh, (laughs) that's so cute. So we aren't literally naked, but like we're barefoot. We're like in the mud and the closer to naked we could be. Also the bath, it's not actually a garden, but like get naked, get in that water. Like that water has like so many healing. I don't even know how much healing it has in it, but it has to have a lot because it feels so good, especially with some magnesium or clay or something in there, but even without it. So you'll do some baths outside. Is that what I hear you saying? Yeah. So we'll do baths inside for sure, like wintertime or just because we need to, but I'll just like set up. We get like the big plastic kiddie pool, like the biggest one I can find. And we'll dump magnesium in there, or you can do the mix up the bentonite clay with water beforehand and mix that in. And then the kids can get in and out and they can get belly sun, belly shade, grass, and the the water. I think the sensory is so good for kids, but also grownups. So then we can be like, we can have it all in our little half acre plot. And what do the Epsom salts help with? What minerals or what properties do they have that, that help with the body? 
So Epsom salts, they're magnesium. So the society we live in, there's so much soil depletion that the food is lower in magnesium than it should be. Also, if you want to be drinking good water, you're going to be filtering it because the at least if you're on city water like we are, is full of junk. So you got to filter everything out. And additionally, we have all these toxins and the body uses magnesium to process toxins and get rid of them. So our society is so depleted of magnesium and Epsom salts, they're magnesium. So you put them in the water and the skin just absorbs the magnesium and the difference can be night and day. Like it is not placebo effect because it works on kids like kids who didn't sleep because their magnesium was too low because magnesium relaxes you like one bath or outside playtime in the pool with magnesium salts. And like that sleep is so much better. It helps. And in mood too, even before the sleep comes, you could see their mood improve because they're just able to relax because they have the magnesium they need to relax. Yeah. I've interviewed several experts who've suggested that magnesium is the one nutrient or mineral that most people are deficient in. So we could all benefit from these magnesium baths, I think. Yes. And they're easy and they're cheap. Like you can pick up magnesium salts just at your grocery store. You don't have to do anything crazy. You can just buy them at the grocery store and dump them in the bath. And it's good for the digestion too, right? Yeah. So some people will take magnesium orally, whether it's in a pill or like liquid drops or like liquids to swallow. I've never found that, like I've always found them hard on the stomach, but a lot of people find it helps them have better bowel movements and also has that nice relaxing effect. So if the bath isn't going to work for you, and I love baths, so that's fine with me to have an excuse, but there is that option. And yeah, it can be helpful for keeping things going. Also, if you're calmer, your digestion is going to be better right? Yes. So it kind of like has like the short term, but then also this long term, like, okay, we can just relax and digest our food. It's so cool. Sally Fallon Morrell, the president of the Weston A. Price Foundation is always saying that science is catching up to ancestral wisdom. I think it's really true because for example, a practice around the world is to pause before eating a meal to offer thanks or gratitude. And That is kind of telling your whole system to kind of calm down, to get ready to receive. It's beginning the digestive process. It's putting the body back into that parasympathetic nervous system mode, which I think is what you're talking about. Absolutely. And actually, yeah, that's something I talk about in my book too, is like this, like this timeless, like worldwide tradition of pausing to give thanks. It's right because we may have grown the food, but it really isn't. We can't take credit for it, right? So it's right, but then it's also just good for us to like relax and not eat on the run all the time. Yeah, 100%. So Erin, we've already started diving into your mom's toolkit that you mentioned in your book, Fully Alive, which I love. And I thought, I just want you to continue sharing bits of wisdom that may be very practical for listeners, especially those with a bunch of kids who are trying to figure out how do I handle these different issues that are coming up? So you've already talked about The importance of getting sun on the body, getting the magnesium in the body, the benefits of being naked in the garden. Let's talk now about maybe some of your favorite essential oils and herbal preparations and what they're good for. Yeah. Oh, I could go on forever. So (laughs) I'll just hit some highlights. (laughs) My number one favorite herb is easily chamomile. It is good, like especially for moms. It's just like, keep it around. You can get the essential oil. It's actually a really pricey one. So I usually just buy the dried chamomile flour in bulk. And then it's super easy. Just like pop it in a mason jar, pour hot water over it, and then let it steep 10, 20 minutes, honestly, however long you want, and then strain it. And then that tea we use for everything. Upset belly, you can sweeten it if the kid doesn't want it, or if the mom doesn't want it straight, you could sweeten it with honey or maple syrup or whatever. It will soothe an upset belly. It is so relaxing. So we definitely, I type A mom, Definitely we'll do a cup of chamomile tea, maybe with a little lavender in there before bed. We'll also use it, obviously, without any sweetener added for pink eye. So we've never actually had pink eye. There's been quite a few times where I'm like, ooh, I feel like I have pink eye coming. Or I've looked at the toddler and been like, that's going to be pink eye. And we've never actually had it because every time we just do the chamomile, we'll either steep a tea bag in some warm water and then put it on there or just kind of wash with the tea. We've never had pink eye. (laughs) Please, God, keep it that way. (laughs) And how did you find out that chamomile was good for these things? I mean, you read about it in a lot of places. I actually love this book, The Alchemy of Herbs by Rosalie de la Ferrette. This is my number one favorite book. She has so many practical, easy to do at home, good for moms, good for anybody, not too expensive, most of them, herbal tips, super well-researched also. 
Awesome. Okay. So chamomile is great for relaxation, for avoiding pink eye, for calming the nervous system. What other herbal remedies or go-tos do you have around the house? So my husband's Polish Irish. So I have white kids who sunburn no matter what we do, but either chamomile tea or mint tea. We'll steep it super strong and then pour it in a cool bath. And then after a day in the sun, pop them in the bath and like have them rub that tea up and down. It does wonders. Also, we do the vitamin C before and after sun exposure. And that really, and whether it's fruit or the powder, like a good quality powder supplement, that makes a huge difference too. But also I'm positive the tea helps. Chamomile or mint tea helps a lot. Since you said you could go on and on, give us another one. Echinacea tincture is a new one that I've discovered. So I don't use it orally because I have autoimmune issues and it can flare them. But I read somewhere, like I fell down some rabbit hole and it said you can use it for any like snake or insect bite just topically. So I thought, hmm, I'm going to try this out. You just get the little echinacea tincture in it with a dropper bottle and pop it in your purse. And then your kids, my kids at least, they are always catching snakes and frogs and getting bee stings. So I was like, okay. So we put it, my daughter, she was probably 18 months, bee sting, put the echinacea tincture on there. She stopped crying. I mean, she was full out screaming, bee sting. She was done. Like it was over five minutes. Wow. Yeah. And it could just pop it in your purse, carry it around. So that's what we do now. Also good for bee stings is bentonite clay. Just mix up a little bit. We keep it a little jar mixed up in the fridge and you can put that on any sting or bite and it'll suck the poison right out. We love that one. So let's say it's been a long day and your kids are done catching the snakes and the frogs and they've had their little bath. What if they still have sleep issues? What do you have in your mom's toolkit to address sleep issues? So all three of my kids have sleep issues. I think partially because they have gut issues and partially because they're tongue tied and partially just because they're two of them are type A like mom. (laughs) So one thing we do, which I would say is like so foundational is just dimming the lights, whether it's getting night lights or getting those fancy like lights without blue light in them. So there's like the whole color spectrum. There's like the warmer and the cooler lights. So if you want warmer lights, if you can get warmer lights, that's going to affect your sleep less. But the sun goes down, that's telling your body, wind down, time to go to bed, turn on that electric light and tell your body, wind back up. It's actually not bedtime. So we keep the lights dim. We use night lights. Sometimes we use Christmas lights for like bedtime routine time, which is really fun too. Yeah, it sounds special. (laughs) Yeah, so we do that. Also, if my son is up reading as he often is, we give him these really cool blue light blocking glasses. And I use them also if I'm up just like washing dishes or whatever. And especially we really don't do screen time before bed. That is, that kills sleep. But if we do, if there's like emails I need to answer or something, the blue light blockers really help. Also, my son gets up I saw, you know, after an hour in bed. He'll come out. I can't sleep. So we either tart cherries or tart cherry juice. Yeah. It's like it is magical for sleep. It's totally not addictive. So a lot of people use melatonin. And I think as far as supplement, you know, it's probably pretty safe, but it's addictive. Tart cherry juice is totally non addictive. And just a couple ounces or like a little handful of the dried tart cherries. It's magical for sleep. And I've read the studies and they supposedly help for falling asleep, staying asleep, more time in deep sleep, more restorative sleep, falling asleep more quickly after like you've been woken in the night. So it like helps with like all of the sleep parameters, but it is magical, tart cherry juice. And what I love, Erin, about this conversation right now is that You're in the trenches. You're with your kiddos. You've tried the different things in the toolkits. You kind of know what works and what doesn't. But I want to ask you a little of the science behind it. Do you know what's in the tart cherry juice by chance? So it's incredibly anti-inflammatory. And I actually, all of my research about it was years ago. So beyond that, I actually don't remember the why of that one. And usually I'm like science nerd. I think it was just that it reduced the inflammation in certain parts of the brain, but I actually don't remember that with certainty. Wow. That is so fascinating. I'm actually particularly interested in the cherry juice because our family doesn't usually do juice. And I think we started making some gummies now you do yep. with some gelatin powder. And anyway, I recently bought some tart cherry juice to add to the gummies that I was making. And now our family just really li- likes the tart cherry juice. And I didn't even know it had this anti-inflammatory property to it. Yeah, no, it's like athletes will use it for faster muscle recovery. Yeah, I'm so interested to kind of like get the word out about tart cherry juice. Like if you have like an inflammatory issue or arthritis or something, that's a great thing to try first because it's so natural, so good for the body. So and Smart Juice is the brand that has 
it's organic and it's also not from concentrate because my family does not do well with juices that are from concentrate. So Smart Juice Organics is the brand I would recommend. What's the issue with the concentrated juices? Yeah. So it took me a long time to trust Dr. Natasha Campbell McBride on this one. I should have trusted her. Like she's so trustworthy. (laughs) But I remember reading her talking about when the juice is concentrated, the sugars like bind in a different way and your body just can't process them anymore. And I was just kind of like, no, it's fine. Like we're not going to drink tons of juice or like juice with added sugar, but like it's fine. Every time I would regret it, whether it was my kids complaining of stomach aches or like having behavior issues or me complaining of stomach ache and having behavior issues. So finally, probably five years ago, I like just swore it off. But that also meant swearing off the tart cherry juice because I could not find something that wasn't from concentrate. So I was delighted at our local food lion. They have this smart juice, organic tart cherry juice stuff from concentrate. We don't go crazy with it. Like it's only juice, pasteurized juice that we'll have and we'll have like a couple ounces, but I love it. Coming up, Erin talks about how to handle chronic and periodic stomach aches. She also shares the deleterious effects a seemingly innocuous change in her home had on her family's health. You're listening to the Wise Traditions Podcast from the Weston A. Price Foundation. We pause now to recognize our sponsors. Paleo Valley. Paleo Valley has a turmeric complex that is rooted in the fact that turmeric is one of the most potent natural ways to encourage a healthy inflammation response in the body. It inhibits the inflammatory factor. And of course, there are a lot of ailments rooted in or exacerbated by inflammation, including issues with joint health, cellular health, blood flow, and neurodegenerative diseases. So they have their turmeric complex that has coconut oil, turmeric, of course, and black pepper, which has been shown to help turmeric absorption by 2,000%. They also include in their complex organic ginger, rosemary, and cloves, which have additional benefits like brain support, support for healthy inflammation response, immune support, and healthy digestion and blood sugar levels. So go to paleovalley.com slash wise to receive 15% off your first order. That's paleovalley.com slash wise for your discount. And Optimal Carnivore. As you know, organ meats are some of the most nutrient-dense foods on the planet. And Optimal Carnivore sources 100% grass-fed organ meats from New Zealand, freeze-drying the organs and encapsulating them into convenient bovine gelatin capsules. The products are 100% grass-fed and grass-finished, and free of hormones, pesticides, antibiotics, and GMOs. And Optimal Carnivore has created a unique blend of nine different organs in their grass-fed organ complex. It's a powerful combination that includes beef liver, brain, thymus, heart, kidney, spleen, pancreas, lung, and gallbladder. And each organ has its own unique benefits and nutritional profile and provides a large range of nutrients that support all of the major organs and glands. So go to amazon.com slash optimal carnivore today and use the code Weston 10 at checkout to save 10% on all products. Remember that optimal carnivore has a grass fed organ complex, a grass fed bone marrow, grass fed liver, brain nourish, and a bone and joint restore. And they also plant one tree for every product sold. So go to amazon.com slash optimal carnivore and use the code Weston 10. This is Hoda Labrada Gore, and you're listening to Wise Traditions. So you mentioned a moment ago that sometimes you have stomach aches or your kids do. That is so common in a lot of households. How do you address digestive issues? So there's the very short term, like we get stomach aches occasionally. And I think that's kind of a different thing than the chronic. So if you have a child or if you have chronic stomach aches, like it's just time to look at what you're eating every day. And if you're already eating well, then it's time to investigate maybe an elimination diet, maybe gaps, maybe the autoimmune protocol. But in terms of like short term, like I have a stomach ache right now. Um, Chamomile tea Mm -hmm. is great. Mint tea or fennel tea, just take the seeds or take the leaves or the little tea bag, pour hot water over it, let it cool, drink it, super helpful. Sauerkraut juice is actually a great digestive. It's acidic, which your body needs the acid to digest. And it's also got the probiotics in it. Those are some easy ones. Broth, you kind of have to have it on hand, which can be worked to make it, although there's some good brands out there now. But broth, like you can feel, like even just a sip or two, I'll like feel that soothing, like going down into my belly, like, oh, that is just what I needed. And also I think our society, so many people in our society are still scared of fat. And like, there are fats to be scared of, like the whatever canola oil, like be scared. (laughs) 
But those good fats are so soothing to the stomach and the digestive tract. So, you know, whether it's butter or coconut oil or your bacon fat, we love to buy bacon just so that we'll have the bacon fat to cook with. Uh But they're so soothing so that you can kind of avoid the stomach ache in the first place. Also, bitter foods. We Americans don't like bitter, but bitter is the bitter taste just like turns on your body. And there's actually bitter receptors all through your gut. So if you eat a bitter food, like every step of your digestion your body is being turned on to digest by that bitter food as it goes through. So you can buy digestive bitters. We like Iberogast. That's been really helpful for us. But also like we just blend up arugula from the garden to make like an arugula pesto. And I'll just serve that as a condiment on the side of things. Anything bitter, dandelion greens, parsley. You look like you have something good to say. I was just thinking you're exactly right. I think we avoid bitters. And I was just wondering, you were saying dandelion green, parsley, What other way do fermented foods count in that category? You could have a fermented food that was also, like if you fermented something bitter, that would work. But fermented foods are awesome, like in their own right. They're so good for digestion. And they're sour, which I think unless it's sweet and sour, again, we Americans don't want it. Like if it's not sour gummy worms, we don't want the sour. (laughs) But yeah, just a soup of sauerkraut or a pickle. My toddler loves having a shot glass full of pickle juice. That's awesome. And I've heard of pickle popsicles that some moms make, right? Oh, that's so fun. Oh, we've never done. I will totally do that. Yeah, she loves cold. So I'm totally making her pickle popsicles. The other question that was on my mind, Erin, is you said we have bitter receptors in every step of digestion. What are the steps that you're aware of with our digestive system? Oh, I love this. Is like my favorite topic. So digestion starts before you start eating. Like you see this food you smell the food. It might be the right time. It's like, oh, this is this is dinner time. Daddy just got home. There's this whole ambiance of eating that tells your body, like, let's eat. And you can feel a lot of times, like salivation starts. Prayer, like you stop, you pray, you thank God for the food, you cut in and start eating. And then you're supposed to chew. <laughs> you may or may not chew. <laughs> and I definitely, whatever, I've got three kids and I've got friends with more than three kids. So I get how hard it is to relax and eat, but that's such an important step to just relax, chew your food. Your saliva has enzymes that start digesting your food. So the more you mix with that saliva, the better. And the more you mush your food up in your mouth, the less work the rest of your gut has to do, right? So that chewing is like that first vital step of digestion. Mm -hmm. So you chew your food, you swallow down into the stomach. The stomach is supposed to be super acidic. Now, a lot of times there can be all kinds of things going on to reduce the acidity of the stomach, but it's supposed to be highly acidic and that helps. It breaks down the food, the enzymes that are in the stomach need the acidity to function. And also the acidity triggers the sphincter, like the opening at the bottom of the stomach to open and let a little bit of food at a time into the small intestine. And then just like pause for a second there. If you are having digestive trouble, one of the first things to look at is, do you have low stomach acid? So that's where your sauerkraut's gonna come in, possibly supplemental stomach acid, a little apple cider vinegar, squeeze of lemon or lime, kombucha, like anything acidic to help that digestion. But that's like a good starting place if you have any gut issues at all. Mm -hmm. So many can be fixed just by fixing a stomach acid. So the food travels through the small intestine. The small intestine is, it's actually very low in bacteria. It's just this like long skinny pipe and the liver and the pancreas dump bile and enzymes into the intestine and they break the food down and you absorb the nutrients, the bulk of the nutrients in the small intestine. And it's, I want to say like 17 feet long. It's super long, (laughs) curves all through there. And then it enters the large intestine. And in the large intestine, there's a little bit of nutrient absorption going on, but mostly it is that there's bacteria working, kind of like helping you with the last bits of nutrients. And then the water is absorbed in the large intestine. And then, yeah, it holds in the rectum. And then when the time comes, you poop it out. And so there's any number of things that can go wrong, (laughs) which can lead to stomach aches. But I like your simple solutions and advice for those who are feeling like they may have low stomach acid. And I just want to interject that sometimes when people have like acid reflux, they think, oh, I have too much acid, but sometimes that's a symptom of too little. Isn't that right? Yeah, I've experienced that big time. When I was pregnant with Fiona, I had terrible reflux. There was no acid in it. I couldn't take, like I would reflux water. The problem was my stomach wasn't acidic enough 
And then wow. if the stomach acid is low, the stomach contents won't actually empty into the small intestine because also the acidity of the stomach is what keeps the sphincter. So you have your esophagus and then a sphincter at the bottom between your esophagus and your stomach. If your stomach is not acidic enough, the sphincter doesn't stay closed tight. So exactly like you say, the acid reflux is what they call it, but it's like very often it's really low acid reflux. And if it was acidic enough, there would be no reflux. So all this makes me think about another section of your book I was looking at, which is troubleshooting breastfeeding issues. And this is important because we want to make sure that the baby is holding on to all the nutrients we're giving it through the breast milk. What are some of the issues that moms encounter or maybe that you've encountered and how did you address them? So I think of my first baby, Seamus, so this is eight and a half years ago now, he was a hot mess. I remember people would talk about reflux like, oh, like he had really bad reflux. He threw up or refluxed a few times an hour. And I was thinking, my kid refluxes like a few times in 10 minutes. Like I stopped cleaning my floor because it was just like pocked with baby spit up. And like, I'm whatever, I grew up around babies. Like I'm not squeamish about spit up, but like this was crazy. Wow. And I had a nursing background and like I had no answers for this. Later, he was colicky. So if you're tongue tied, you don't, when you swallow, you can't press on the roof of your mouth and pressing on the roof of your mouth tells your stomach food's coming. So there's a nerve connecting the mouth and the stomach, the vagus nerve. And if you're tongue tied, you can't send the message to your stomach that there's food coming. So it doesn't start producing stomach acid. Ah. And babies don't produce a ton of stomach acid. And yet that warning like, hey, there's food on the way is huge. So that was probably a huge part of his reflex was that he was like severely tongue tied. He was probably two and a half. And I found like a really good pediatrician. She literally looked at him and she goes, oh, he's tongue tied because she could see like because of the way his cheek muscles had developed mm. that they had like developed in a way to compensate for this tongue tie. But I was amazed. I was like, how did nobody tell me that before? Uh-huh. Like we could have solved this problem. So I think one of the first things to look at if you're having breastfeeding issues is tongue tie because of epigenetics and the toxins that are so prevalent right now in our society. Tongue tie, I think it's somewhat overdiagnosed, but it is also like definitely on the rise. And if you can find a good lactation consultant to help you to figure out if that's what you are dealing with is tongue tie. Honestly, a good lactation consultant is what you need for breastfeeding issues. And if you have a lactation consultant who is A, not taking your questions seriously. So if you're saying like, hey, I think he has tongue tie. And she's like, oh, it's something else. And brushing you off that's like a big no-no. Or if she doesn't leave you feeling empowered, like you have some options and information, then just get another one. Most of them are great. Some of them are bad. But if you get a bad one, get another one. (laughs) (laughs) And when you had Seamus's tongue tie addressed, you said it was like nearly miraculous, I think in your book. Yes, it was life-changing. So we didn't get it addressed until I was like about to publish the book. So I didn't write about it in there. Oh, I just heard about it, I guess. (laughs) Yeah, I think I mentioned it to you, but I did kind of allude to it in my book. So he was diagnosed when he was two and a half. So two and a half is a really bad time to have oral surgery. Mm. Also, I'm just disinclined to do oral surgery unless I'm convinced it's necessary. So we kind of were trying other things to improve his health and his chewing. And then COVID happened. So you can't do elective surgery during COVID. That was really difficult. So he was probably seven and it was finally the time that we could like really focus on this and get it done. It was a big journey. We had to find someone who was willing to do it without anesthesia because we have like the genetic mutation where you don't process the toxins very well. So I did not want to have that child who had this severe reaction to the anesthesia. So it was this huge journey finding everything or everyone we needed. But we got an awesome periodontist. And he said, before we go, we needed to have these like weeks of oral myofunctional therapy, which actually just the oral myofunctional therapy made a huge difference in his sleep, in his chewing. Because like he was a kid, I'd say like, okay, so chew Seamus, like just chew your food. And I would watch him and he'd move his mouth. I can't even mimic it. He would try to chew, but you could see the food wasn't getting chewed and he'd swallow and there'd still be food in his mouth at seven. Wow. Like we're not talking about a toddler here. And he'd work like once a week with the therapist and then every day with me to improve his chewing skills and his speech skills. He was good at speaking, but it was like a lot of things were compensated. So already in the weeks before he actually had the clip done, I could see like he would suddenly sleep in. He'd never slept in in his life. He would go to bed however late he went to bed or if he was up in the middle of the night, which he always was. He would never make up for sleep in the morning. All of a sudden, it would be 7.30. I'm like, wait, where's where's my kid? (laughs) 
And then he'd roll out of bed and be like, oh, I just stay in bed for a while. I'm like, yeah, the first, like that's really interesting timing. <laughs> And then he got the phrenectomy is what it's called. And obviously, like the days immediately after the phrenectomy were rough, like he was in a lot of pain and things. But suddenly, he was calm. Like he had been in fight or flight, I think, since he was born, literally. Or probably since he was in utero, actually. He was hyper. I knew he was a different kid since he was in utero. And he was suddenly able to be calm. Like he was still passionate. He was still alive. But he was able to just be calm and now he sleeps in all the time. Like he doesn't he doesn't sleep late, but he sleeps and he chews. It's amazing. So the tongue tie was affecting him on many more levels than you might have even suspected. Yeah, it was affecting everything. Also his posture, like he was always like hunched, kind of like an old man. And there was no lack of strength. We'd go to the chiropractor, all these things. And suddenly after the phrenectomy, a few weeks later, I was like, wait a second, he's sitting right like all the coaching, all the like, oh, please sit up straight yeah. that you say to your kids never made. I mean, he'd try, but nothing happened. And he was suddenly like holding himself up. It was incredible. Like whenever I'm just watching him, it's still incredible to see like he's comfortable in his body. He also holds his chiropractic adjustments. Before, like after a week, I'd be like, wow. I mean, we can't go every week, but it's like, wow, we need to go back to the chiropractor. You're not functioning right. Whereas now it's like month, six weeks. And I'm like, yeah, you're still fine. Yeah, it's crazy. It is crazy. It's affecting everything. You know, there's so many stones to unturn when you're leading your family and you're trying to enable health, helping your children to be as healthy as possible. There's so many things, so many factors. I think it's really important to listen to your intuition. And that leads me to my next question to you, Erin, is that while you were writing your book, as I understand it, you had noticed your kids' health and behavior kind of, I don't want to say collapse, but you had many challenges during the <sighs> course of a year and you finally hit on something that hadn't even occurred to you to look at. What was that thing? Yes. So this was like in like the publishing year. So like I spent three years writing and then I took a year off to have a baby. And then I was like, okay, we're just gonna do the like the home stretch here. So Maeve is, she's almost two now. So it was, she was three months. And she was like the first easy baby. Like she was tongue tied, but we knew we had it clipped. She was calm. She was peaceful, happy. I was like the empowered, empowered mom of like now three kids. And I remember standing in my backyard. She was asleep in the little baby carrier, and the, the older two kids are playing happily. And I was like, wow, this is like my dream life. And then somebody came from the power company and he was replacing our meter, our power meter in our carport. And I remember like somewhere in the back of my brain, I was like, oh yeah, those smart meters, they've got like EMF signals, but like we have cell phones. I was like, this is probably not a battle worth fighting. It's not like we hang out over there right next to it where it's fine. So I remember my kids actually were really interested and they came and they watched him put the thing in. The gentleman was really nice. And I did not think about it again. Like that moment was just like buried in my memory. But reflecting on it, that was like the day it changed from like, Maeve is my happy baby and I have my happy life with three kids. I'll probably have 20 kids. These kids are so easy kind of attitude. And it so quickly changed. And I was like, oh, I guess she's just teething. Maeve was suddenly upset all the time. I was like, oh, I guess it's her teeth. All my kids teeth early. She must be teething. And she was teething, but she was more miserable than that. She was suddenly waking all the time. And I was like, oh, it's the four-month sleep regression. All of a sudden, she was then like four and a half year old who'd adjusted beautifully to giving somebody else the baby of the family spot was suddenly having temper tantrums like three, four, five times a week. So I was like, oh, great. So I was doing all the nice mom things, all the firm mom things, all the nice and firm mom things at the same time. <laughs> In the meantime, like this baby is getting more and more colicky. Her reflux was getting worse and worse. So like she would only sleep in the baby carrier. So that meant I'm like spending my life trying to keep this baby sleep in the baby carrier, which is like very time consuming. So I'm like more and more checked out from my big kids. So I kind of was just like, oh, that's why, like I'm not cooking enough. They're eating too much whatever, plantain chips, that's why their guts are getting worse and worse. And I'm not eating as well. That's why the baby's getting gassier and gassier and gassier. And I was like trying to do all the things with all the tools I had, but nothing was getting better. I cut out goat dairy and that helped a little bit. Like just little things helped a little bit, but things were terrible. And my kids were sick constantly. So previously my kids would get sick like once a season, maybe. People were sick, we'd go, whatever. Unless you're throwing up, we'll go to your house anyways because my kids never got sick. So why would I worry about it? All of a sudden, my kids were sick with everything. I stopped. I literally stopped like planning anything beyond the next day wow. because my kids were sick all the time. And I would get sick too. Like I used to go two, two years out getting sick. 
and everything they got, I would get, and I'd get like a sinus infection. And and I was like, what is going on here? And then one day I was, so this is a year of this. I was walking up and down the street with a baby because naked in a garden, go outside. Everything's better outside. I was walking up and down the street with a baby and I ran into a neighbor I hadn't seen in really a year whose name is also Erin, by the way. She's great. And I was like, Erin, how are you? And she goes like, today I'm okay. My limes is flaring. She has chronic limes. And I was like, oh, I'm so sorry. Like, what's up? And she goes, oh, like the smart meter they put in our house was making my limes flare. And then I got it taken out and I was doing really well. And then they put it back and like, I'm almost non-functional. And I was like, what? And she's like, yeah, it caused like all these immune problems. It causes yeast issues. And I was like, what? Because my, so Maeve at that point was one and we'd finally gotten her diagnosed with like massive yeast overgrowth. She was literally one and not eating any solids because- her gut symptoms were horrific if she had any salt. This is after like two kids of like SIBO and GAPS. Like I knew all the things. Mm-hmm. Like I couldn't have been screwing up that badly, right? Mm-hmm. I was like, what? So I like, thanks, Aaron. So I like I went home and I like got online and like started researching. Turns out smart meters are not like cell phones. Like I, whatever, I don't talk with my cell phone right on my head mm-hmm. or things like that. Like I'm not, we're very low, low electronics family. But this smart meter is a whole new level from cell phones. I think there's different smart meters and there's different research, but the signal they send out is like 250 times stronger than a cell phone. 250 times. That's crazy. Yes. That's so intense. That's going to have an effect on the human body, right? And especially on these little tiny growing bodies. So I started like diving into like the research and actually the Weston A. Price Foundation has a couple of good articles about it. But the type of radiation they use is a class one carcinogen. So meaning like lead is a class one carcinogen. It causes cancer even if there's no compounding factors. Smart meters have this, like the radiation is in the same classification. It suppresses the immune system. What? Which is probably why may have had the yeast overgrowth. It also causes behavioral problems. So I, whatever, got on the phone, started making calls like, okay, what can I do about this? And our power company thankfully has like an opt-out option. So we have now, it's called a non-communicating smart meter. So it still reads our power minute by minute. And it also still has like stronger electromagnetic field in the house, but it doesn't transmit this super strong signal. Mm. And so they took it out and we're on a Tuesday. They took it out. And I was like, okay, like, please, this can like be a moment of change. But I wasn't really expecting anything right away. By Friday of that week, I suddenly realized that I enjoyed, like I was excited to put my kids to bed. And I was like, wait a second. I have not been excited. Like, I like mom life. Like, I love all the mom life stuff. I'm just that person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, wait, I have not looked forward to bedtime routine in over a year because all of my kids were totally different. They were all suddenly like peaceful I mean, they might be overtired or they might, whatever, like they're still kids. Yeah. But there was just just like this angst that was suddenly gone. And Maeve might still have trouble falling asleep because she was gassy or whatever, but she was peaceful. Wow. I was like, what's going on? And then all the yeast treatment we were doing and like inching forward with progress, not really getting anywhere. Suddenly it was working. By the end of another week, she was pooping solid, which is like too much information, (laughs) but she was... 15 months by then and not pooping solid ever. And she was suddenly like pooping, like solid poops. And she went from almost exclusively breastfed to like eating a solid, like half to three quarters of her own food within like two months. Fabulous. I'm sure you could go on and on. It's I could keep going. It all changed like on a dime. The temper tantrums are gone. They just like stopped. Like as soon as it was out, it was crazy. Well, this is helpful to put in the mom's toolkit to look into what kind of meter is close to your home and realize that that kind of radiation may be impacting your family's health and behavior as well. So, so much to look into. I feel like there are other things I wish I could have covered with you, but maybe we'll have you write an article in the journal or maybe we'll get you back on again, Erin, sometime. But in the meantime, let me ask you the question I like to pose at the end of the podcast. If the listener could just do one thing to improve their health, and again, you know a lot of different tools and hacks, but if they could just do one thing to improve their health, what would you recommend that they do? I would recommend doing the thing that you know you need to do. 
so often we know exactly what we need to do and we're scared to do it because we think we can't do it. Like the gospel story of the loaves and the fishes. Like you just bring your little loaves and fishes that is not enough to feed 5,000 people or like your hungry kids who are also having whatever problems they're having and just do that one thing you can do that you already know. Just do it and God will bless it like a hundredfold. Like he will make it enough. So just like start that journey, do that one thing and the next thing will show itself. But like, don't be scared. Just like dive in, get the help you need and do it. Thank you, Erin, so much. This has been a delightful conversation. Thank you, Hilda. Our guest today was Erin O'Donnell. Visit FullyAliveFamilies.com to learn more. And I'm Hilda Labrador, the host and producer of this podcast on behalf of the Weston A. Price Foundation. I have resources on my website, HolisticHilda.com. And for the transcript for this podcast episode, visit our website, WestonAPrice.org, and click on the podcast page. And now for a recent review from Apple Podcasts. Peach in the Pines had this to say, wisdom my heart resonates with. I just finished listening to episodes 369 and 370, and I have goosebumps in a good way. These episodes were so pure and delivered sound wisdom and truths that stuck to the core of what is going on in the world today, shedding light on what so many people struggle to grasp and understand. I love how these episodes discuss wisdom and truths that my heart can resonate with, but delivered in such a simple and easy to understand way. I love each and every episode and look forward to new ones. Thank you with all my heart for consistently bringing this information to light and unapologetically discussing topics that need to be shared. I've been wanting to leave this review for a long time, and I can't even form enough supporting words to express my gratitude and appreciation for this podcast. Highly recommend listening to it and suggest you don't wait another minute to get started. Peach in the Pines, that is awesome. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you're still enjoying the show. You too can rate and review it just by going to Apple Podcasts, click on ratings and reviews, give us as many stars as you like, and tell the world why they should listen to the show. And thank you so much in advance. Stay well, my friend, and remember to keep your feet on the ground and your face to the sun. On behalf of the Weston A. Price Foundation, thanks for listening. We have many free resources to support you on your health journey. Visit WestonAPrice.org to find podcasts, articles, videos, and more. You can also find a local chapter near you for help in finding sources of great food. We invite you to support the Foundation's mission of education, research, and activism by becoming a member. Thanks again, and take care. Wise Traditions is a project of the Weston A. Price Foundation for wise traditions in food, farming, and the healing arts. The content on this podcast is provided for informational purposes only and is not intended to substitute for the advice provided by your doctor or other healthcare professional. It is not intended to be, nor does it constitute healthcare or medical advice.